Hello folks, this is Chris from Comic Tropes, and I have a unique unboxing video for you. This pretty heavy package here was sent to me by one of my listeners, Andrew Sorhan, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Andrew. Uh, he offered, he said he had a bunch of comic books from his home country of Australia that he thought I might find interesting. I said, sure, I've not read Australian comics, so he sent me this quite large package, and I am going to open it for the first time right now so that uh, we can all see together what kind of stuff is in here. Because, you know, maybe I'll review some of this stuff. I, I probably won't review all of it, and even if I do review it, you know, it could be a while. So I thought, well, let's at least do an unboxing video so that we can all sort of see what it is and uh, have some fun that way. So I'm pretty excited and I'm seeing Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. This is some sort of separate mailer inside and I'm gonna have to be careful, I don't wanna give away his address or anything. So, it's heavy. All right, I'll just sort of show you that. I'll cover that up and, uh... ah, look at that. Hi, Winnie the Pooh, hi, Tigger. And, okay, this is already open here, so I'm just gonna pull out from the top a bunch of these comics and then we'll start going through them. Let's see what we got here. This this seems very generous. Oh my goodness, I don't mean to pour it all out. It's okay. It looks like he sent me uh, included uh, letters, notes on each of these. Some of these look kind of old. But we've got an Osamu Tezuka book right off the bat. Adam Cat, uh, I guess like the kitty sidekick of Astro Boy. Let's see. Adam Cat, I was given devils of this trade when I backed the Kickstarter for Osamu Tezuko's Unico. Adam Cat was one of the stretch goals. I assure, I assume, I think that's what it's saying. I assume the, the devil was a mistake. Now it's yours. Later in his career, Osamu Tezuka was focused on marketing Astro Boy, Tetsuan Adam in Japan to much younger children. Adam Cat is part of that focus, but also exists entirely to facilitate a pun. It's kind of a retelling of Astro Boy, but as a cat. Tetsuan Adam became Adam Cat. Gotta love that commitment to a pun. All right, well, if he's written notes like this, I think that Andrew has given us a full episode. Look at that, yeah, funded by Kickstarter. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so nice, that's so generous, like, already. I can't wait to read that. I have read some Astro Boy, and of course I love Pluto, which is Naomi Urasawa's uh, very grounded, realistic take on um, one of Astro Boy's most famous stories, the greatest robot in the world. So I'm definitely into this stuff, and uh, that, that's great. Beano Comic Library, Ivy the Terrible. Definitely looks like sort of a gag, funny type thing. I should have looked this up before. I don't know uh, Australian money. I thought that it was dollars, but this is 28p. That sounds like 28 pence. Well, let's read the, uh, let's read the letter and let Andrew explain. Beano Comic Library number 153. I talk more about the Beano in another note page. I threw in this book so you could see a British Digest-sized comic. The most famous and longest running is Commando, with 4,958 issues as of October 2016. Yeah, I wikipedia that. It must have, it must have well over 5,000 by now. Wow. These comics contain a single story with one to three panel pages, which are produced at a breakneck speed by often uncredited workmen, artists, and writers. If you're even vaguely interested, you can probably pick up hundreds of Commandos or other British small format comic books on eBay, cheap as chips. <laughs> is that a phrase? Cheap as chips? I like that. Ivy the Terrible is one of about a billion characters trying to rip off the success of the British version of Dennis the Menace. She's mostly unremarkable. Well, I'm still curious. This is, uh, 
very reminiscent of like uh, the sort of Archie digests that we have in grocery stores, Archie Comics digests. But uh, if they're, you know, like three panel strips, that sounds very close to um, comic strips from newspapers where, where comic books evolve from. So that, that's kind of interesting. A British book. Platinum Grit. Let's read what uh, Andrew has to say about this. Platinum Grit. This is an Australian indie comic from the small 1990s Australian indie boom. It was something really special to me at the time, but I almost never see Aussie comics from this period for sale anymore. Platinum Grit really stood out. The characters are lively, the cartooning is excellent, and the scenarios are insane. The book actually started with an appearance in a series called Issue 1. But I don't have it, so you don't either. <laughs> the whole series only went for 10 issues in print form, but years later it popped up again as a webcomic, so if you enjoy this book, you can check it out at www.platinumgrit.com. That's pretty easy to remember, platinumgrit.com. I checked to make sure the website is still up before writing this. Trudy Cooper, the artist, is also responsible for the thoroughly not-safe-for-work sex comedy fantasy webcomic Oglaf, which I do also recommend, if only for her great art. I have read that, actually, and that is great art. I didn't recognize this right away. This must be some pretty early work by, uh, by Trudy. Huh. Yeah, Oglaf has amazing artwork, but it's very, very not-safe-for-work. It's all sex jokes. Uh, if you're wondering why this page has weird cutouts, it's because I thought it would stop the tape from sticking the pages of the note together. <laughs> if you look, he's uh, sort of cut here and here, folded it over so that you could then tape it to the book. Very thoughtful. Platinum Grit, that could be a lot of fun. I'm definitely familiar with this artist, not familiar with anything from the uh, 90s Australian comic boom. Uh, the 90s were, of course, a huge boom here in the United States, but they were huge um, everywhere. Uh, Japan, for instance, also had a huge boom in the mid-90s. Um, in the early 90s, Weekly Shonen Jump might have been moving somewhere around like uh, two or three million copies uh, a week, and uh, by the mid-90s uh, into the sort of late 90s, it was doing more like six, almost seven million copies. So there was a boom almost everywhere. All right, I can already see that this is Transformers, so I'm pretty excited about this because uh, Transformers, for those who have not heard, was sort of my introduction to comic books. They, they were the first ones I, I sort of read um, taking seriously on my own. Like I had been given two or three before that, but uh, yeah, look at that. Okay, these are definitely just like the... Uh, the U.S. version. See, they even have the uh, the U.S. and Canada pricing on it. Oh, but I haven't read these since, uh, geez, when would this have been? Like, late 80s, I guess? Mid to late 80s? I got, I'm curious why he included these. This is great. Oh, and there's that cover, too. I totally remember this issue. The mechanic, he got like one of Ratchet's, Ratchet the Autobot's uh, tools, and it allowed him to lift heavy things, so he went around beating up Transformers. <laughs> All right, Transformers, 28, 29, 56, and 59. These are just some random Transformers comics. I know I said I wasn't going to send many American comics, but there is a bit of a Transformers theme to this package, just because that's what was laying around here in my interesting devils, in my more interesting devils. The condition is a bit atrocious. Have I already apologized for that? No need to apologize. This is all, this is all fun to read. The first two issues are written by Bob Badansky and drawn by Don Perlin. Badansky is more well known for mainstream comics as an editor, particularly on Spider-Man. But he's kind of the Larry Hama of Transformers. He wrote the toy bios and named the larger bulk of the original G1 Transformers. I didn't realize that. Don Perlin is a workman Marvel artist known for Werewolf by Night, co-creating Moon Knight, and later for Bloodshot under Valiant Comics. Uh, the second two issues 
That's what I was just holding up on this one. The second two issues are written by Simon Furman, another candidate for the Larry Hama of Transformers for his long association with Transformers as a writer, and drawn by Jose Delbo. Delbo and Furman are mostly only known for their Transformers work, but they also created Brute Force together. Oh, that's funny. Someday Brute Force is a potential candidate for a Comic Tropes episode. Furman also had a long run on Alpha Flight and wrote North Star's first limited series. Very cool. I loved Transformers growing up. I still have a lot of affection for Transformers, so uh, that's very kind of Andrew to include some of these. Uh, this is the Beano issues 1,552 and 2,873. Started in 1938, the Beano is one of the world's longest-running comics with one of the highest issue counts. I think it's got over 4,000 issues out now. I'd have to check, but I think Commando, another British comic by the same publisher, DC Thompson, has a higher issue count. I think he's right, but I'm not as familiar. There's a lot to say about the Beano. It's a very traditional British comic. It's in a tabloid or magazine format. Yeah, you can sort of see that, like it's uh, taller, bigger than your normal comic book. Um, let's see, it's an anthology. It's squarely aimed at young children. Uh, like most British comics in the old days, as with the 1972 issue I've given you, the Beano was printed with varying levels of color. Uh, in this case, the front and back two pages were full color, and so was the center page. Other features were in black and white, or black, white, and red. Later, the Beano became a full color comic, as with the 1997 issue. So, I guess that's... let's open that up. Um, just got a snippy snip. Um, in fact, this issue is probably part of the very uh, earliest era of full-color Beanos. Look at that. Dennis the Menace and Nasher. Huh. All hail King Dennis. This is just weird to me because they're saying all hail King Dennis. Dennis the Menace. This doesn't look anything like Dennis the Menace, right? But they're saying Dennis here. So I'm, our, I'm a little confused. The UK's number one comic. All right, well, let's keep reading. Um... Features in these comics were one to two pages long at most, and the most popular features had the cover, the back page, and then the center spread uh, were reserved for the next most popular features, a very obvious hierarchy even the youngest readers were aware of. Yeah, uh, Japan's uh, Weekly Shonen Jump does something very similar. A, a lot of their jump issues do. Uh, the longest running feature in the Beano is Dennis the Menace, a British character first published completely coincidentally just a month or so after the American character of the same name. Oh my god, I've never heard about this. The British version of Dennis the Menace is way better than the American one. Not cloying and saccharine, this character is a rough little badass and genuinely wanted to be a menace. You'll notice that these two comics are very different sizes. Yeah, they're tabloid size. Uh, that's because British comics, unlike American ones, have no standardized sizes. It is a goddamn nightmare for collection and storage, let me tell you. Yeah, this would not fit in a traditional comic book box. This is just too tall, so you have to put this like on an actual uh, sized uh, bookshelf, I guess, or, or stack them in a file box, something like that. You might notice that I made the boards for your Beanos by sticking together backing board uh, offcuts with tape. Yep. Look at that. Uh, it's acid-free tape, and no, I haven't done this for all of the hundreds of books I own. That would be a nightmare. The bags were custom-made for a local comic store in the 1980s, and when this store closed down recently, I bought the last of his stock. Okay, this stuff is boring. Ignore me. No, no, this isn't boring at all. This is very different than I think most of the comics that... Uh, uh, the majority of my readers are familiar with. So so I think this is very, very cool. Thank you very much for something so unique. I can't wait to actually uh, read it. I, at first I thought that the cover was missing, but now I just see that, no, that this is just sort of how it's published. Um, I don't know if this even... I'm, I'm trying to look. I These don't have staples? Oh, no, they do. Uh, the, the 97 one has staples. Does this one have staples? I think it's just folded. That's very different. 
this looks, yeah, 1984 it says on it, and, and I believe it. Just look at it. The Dandy. I'm opening up the note for this. The Dandy Book, 1984. American annuals were, are, oversized comics. True. Usually like 64 pages or something like that. Usually used as best of reprint volumes. Well, until Jack Kirby and Stan Lee started using them as giant 13th issues for the year for Fantastic Four. Now, now they're mostly unremarkable one-shots. Yeah, Andrew's right. British annuals? They're a completely different thing. British annuals are hardcover books usually released before the Christmas meant as stocking stuffers. They are easily the most collectible British comics and are utterly fascinating in their breadth and variety. Sadly, the heyday of the British annual is over, but oh my god, did they get nuts when they were prominent. Uh, let's see. I personally own GoBots, Transformers, Garfield, N Knight R Rider, uh, Muppet Show, Rambo, Star Trek, James Bond, Thundercats, Care Bears, and even Charlie Chaplin annuals, and that only scratches the surface. I have never heard of any of this. It's a pretty good gig. Um, the Dandy. I should talk about that too. The Dandy is the Beano's brother comic. It's older, but it's been canceled, so it's not as long lasting. Uh, it only lasted from 1937 to 2012. That's an incredible run. It's essentially the exact same format as the Beano, but with different featured strips. Because this is an annual, the quality of the strips is much higher than normal, so you get to see the Dandy at its best. I'll let you decide if its best is any good. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, look at that. A hardcover book. I can't imagine any comic book releasing every year a hardcover special issue. Like maybe a compilation that sells well gets put into a hardcover. But that's about it here in America. Very different. These are called Fru Phantom. Fru must be like the publisher or something like that. Uh, 1168 and 1171. Yeah, this is the character created by Lee Falk, but I, I haven't really seen it in a comic book like this. All right. Um, the Phantom by Fru has been in continuous publication as a single volume since 1948, September, making it one of the longest running comics in the world. The book reprints Phantom newspaper strips and Scandinavian Phantom comics. Jeez, that's unique. And in recent years, has branched out into reprints from all over the world. The Phantom seems to have had original material created in every country you can think of. Turkey, Spain, Italy, India, and so on. These two issues are reprints from Phantom N, the Scandinavian Phantom comic book, which has been running since 1950. His popularity has faded a lot in recent decades, but from around 1940 to the 1980s, the Phantom was the defining superhero to Australian audiences. Well, that's, that's interesting. These two books aren't much to write home about, but give you a glimpse at another Australian comic book format. Ah, that's very exciting. Thank you. And yeah, um, you can see that it's got the Australian and New Zealand uh, prices. So, that's cool. I know this character, but I have to admit that I've never been, like, a big fan because I feel like he's never been that popular here in America. I mean, it's something that we sort of all know, but I don't know that anybody's a massive fan of the Phantom. I never see cosplayers dressed up as the Phantom, but, but he has been around a long, long time. All right, those are very cool. Uh, I just want to make it clear that I do not expect donations on this channel because, I mean, I can't promise that I can review every single comic. There's just too many of them uh, out there, and a lot of people have lots of different ideas. But uh, I will at least do some sort of an unboxing like this and, you know, try to read as much as I can uh, and, you know, consider it as potential material. So, yeah, more Phantom. Okay, let's see what this says. Giant Size Phantom number one and two. Yep, there's number one. And, uh, here's number two. Oh, I like that artwork. Is that... That's almost like Brian Boland, but I don't think it is Brian Boland. No, it isn't, but it's... It's definitely sort of mimicking his style, isn't it? Yeah, it says here, somebody named Glumsden. Glumsden. Maybe this is also from Scandinavia. Let's look. 
Uh, here are the books that motivated me to send this package. I wanted them to go to a good home. Fru's The Phantom is a huge piece of Australian comic history, and I don't think anything quite reveals that like reading other Australian superhero product. They are far more influenced by, and often straight up ripped off from, The Phantom and newspaper adventure serials than they are Superman and Batman. I don't need to go into detail. The editorial content in these books, and in all Fru Phantom books, is just excellent. The only thing I should warn you about it is that, well, some of these strips are sideways. This is because uh, some... Oh, let's see. I can just read this letter. This is because they're aping the Phantom. Okay, this is because they're aping the Phantom. The first couple of Phantom comics by Fru were printed in landscape format to match the shape of the comic strips. Okay, I get that. Um, interesting. Because a landscape format is a bit crappy for news agents' shelves, they switch to a portrait format with issue number three, but only for the covers. The interiors were still landscape. You had to turn the book to read it. Don't love doing that, but I understand why they'd format it that way. Bafflingly, they seem to have followed this format, at least for a little while, for some of their in-house content, too. Oh well, at least with these reprints, you get the authentic experience of bafflingly turning the book on its side, just like kids in the 1950s. Very exciting. I can't wait to read this. Look at that. It really is actually quite good art, though, I will say that. Like, you know, for a moment I was wondering if this was Brian Boland, and, you know, upon closer inspection, I'm like, no, it, it isn't. But, it's good. So I'm excited to read these. Thank you. This is another Australian reprint of an American comic book. This is a Dreamwave Transformers comic book. Okay, that was like, uh, that was like late 90s, early 2000s, if I remember. Maybe early 2000s? Yeah, it was early 2000s. The comic is awful, but it gives you an idea of the half-size format some Australian reprints have. Uh, they were half-size normal, standard American comic, and magazine-size reprints on the shelves all at the same time in the 1980s. Oh, that's that's interesting. I call this a half-size book, not because it's half the size of an American book, but rather because it is A5-sized. Half the size of a standard A4 paper sheet. So yeah, if we like put it on its side, like this is cutting it off in half. Interesting. Half-size suggests the shrunkenness to people not familiar with the A paper format. You know, just the USA. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, this isn't quite as small as our digest size. Um, it's just taking advantage of the uh, A5 paper size and I guess folding it in half. I think this might be an Archie book. <laughs> Betty's Tyree. Wow, did Laura really say that about Reggie and Veronica? What did she say? I've got to read to find out. I'll be honest, I've only included this to talk about some other Archie stuff. This book comes from the late 80s, early 90s period of Archie comics I like to call the Archie Experiment. This period saw Archie release a host of new titles, experimenting with ongoing continuity per book, not a unified Archie shared universe. Sometimes surreal storytelling and some really out there concepts. Betty's Diary is sadly the most pedestrian, standard comic in these launches. Titles to look into include Faculty Funnies, the Riverdale teachers as superheroes, Jughead's Time Police, Jughead joins the Time Police, Dilton's Weird Science, Science Adventure, Archie 3000, the future as imagined by Archie creators in the 80s. I love retro f uh, future stories, they're always funny. Uh, Jughead's pal Hot Dog, Jughead's dog, gets a super science kennel from a race of alien space dogs. Hmm, could happen. Archie's RC Racers, a licensed comic, Archie and the gang doing a remote-controlled car race around America. Oh my god, that sounds... that sounds insane. I gotta look that one up. Archie's RC Racers. And Jughead's Diner. Jughead travels to another dimension and becomes involved in the surreal antics of a storage... Oh, strange. 
of a strange 1950s diner thing. It's really weird. That's enough for now. This stuff is amazing. Unfortunately, all I have for you is Betty's Diary. It does have a super sexist story telling girls to get back in the kitchen that was dated for 1987, let alone now, in it. Yeah, that does sound dated. Wow. 75 cents. I remember those days. 87 was just when I was starting to get into comics. Wow. Dear Diary, today I picked up more dirt with my phone than I did with my vacuum. That's a pretty exciting diary entry there, Betty. Thanks. Foot Trot Flats 4. Could this be an indie comic? It's just got different coloring and size than most of what I'm used to. Foot Trot Flats number 4. It's hard to say this is the best comic strip of all time because of the sheer volume of material we're talking about. I kind of have to mentally divide comic strips into vague eras. The early days, the Sunday supplement era, the daily strip era, the horrible, horrible modern period. The Foot Trot Flats might not be better than Flash Gordon or the work of Hal Foster at their height, but I'd say it's the best of the daily strip era. Better than Garfield, that's a low bar, The Phantom, okay, or Calvin and Hobbes, or even Peanuts. All right, that's saying a lot. Wow, Calvin and Hobbes is amazing, and, and early Peanuts is too. I know that's a big claim, and it's a claim that is definitely tinged with nostalgia. I grew up with Foot Trot Flats. It is utterly familiar and warm to me. Foot Trot Flats is from New Zealand, created by cartoonist Murray Ball. It feels local and part of my culture, more local than American comics. People play cricket and rugby union. People use familiar slang. It just feels close to home. Obviously, there are also some very New Zealand-specific things, the terrain, references to the All Blacks, those sorts of things. But even those things were culturally familiar to childhood me. But it's not just nostalgia. Foot Trot Flats is just flat out good. It is drawn better than nearly anything I've ever seen in my life. Better than anything I've seen in my life. The characters are so distinct and so expressive. The environments are so detailed and lively compared to the other super bland, undetailed comic strips of the time, and is also, and it is almost too much. Okay. The writing is also great. Sharp, I'm trying to read this word. Oh, sharp observation. Clear characters with really unique voices. You really believe this is a version of farm life. It's amazing that something so cartoony can feel so real. Oddly, the strip shares some things in common with Garfield, a much less artistically dynamic and experimental comic. The main character is an animal, a dog named Dog, who is the only animal we can see the thoughts of. His owner is a hapless guy who's a bit unlucky in love. As a kid, I kind of associated these strips together. Looking back, holy crap, why? Garfield is so, so bad compared to Foot Trot Flats. You might find it more like Calvin and Hobbes in terms of sheer artistry. Man, I've prattled on a lot, huh? Look, long and short of it, I love this comic. I hope you like it too. One detail that might be confusing on first read, the dog's kennel is an old aluminum water tank turned on its side with the opening for the water pipe in the top of the tank as the entrance to the kennel. Okay, very cool. Well, if you love it this much, um, I will prioritize this. This looks very interesting to me. Thank you very much. Fun with Betty and Veronica, but it's in a totally different size than I'm used to. Look at that. I don't see any of the familiar indicia or anything. I promised some weird Australian reprints. Here's one. It's from 1986 by Yaffa Publishing. Uh, it has about three Archie comics worth of content, but doesn't actually line up perfectly with the content of any digest or individual issue I could find. The cover is from Archie's Girls, Betty and Veronica number 330, and the interior includes material from at least five other comics. Oddly, some of these Yaffa reprints line up well to a specific run of individual issues, while others, like this one, are all over the shop. The thing I really love about these old Australian reprints is the chance to see uncolored line art of stuff you might not see reprinted otherwise. Oh, that does sound cool. Plus, there is a nostalgia factor for me that won't really affect you. No, but I, I, I do like uh, Archie in general. Um, I really like what they've been doing with Archie in the last couple of years. That's cool. 
Transformers Armada 1 to 4 and Energon 1 to 4 toy pack in comics. Oh, interesting. These eight comics were packaged with toys from the Transformers Armada and Transformers Energon toy ranges. Uh, I have so many of these things. During Armada, Transformers toys had multilingual packaging, including these comics. This led to some of the most legendarily bad dialogue in Transformers comics ever. By issue three, they were just being printed in English, which made things a bit better. These comics were produced by Dreamwave Productions for Hasbro and were the start of a long tradition of Transformers pack-in comics. They are, however, the only pack-ins outside of Japan with new original content. All later pack-ins were normal-sized reprints of IDW comics. You might notice I've included a bunch of these things, only about a third of what I own. I figured they might be good giveaways for Patreon or whatever. Oh, that's so nice. Let's see. So, I guess, yeah, he, he gave me, like, multiple copies of several of these. That's so cool. All right. I love it. I love it. I can't wait to read this stuff. That This will be uh, nostalgia fun for me because I love Transformers, but uh, I definitely didn't, like, watch either of these cartoons or get the toys at this point in time. So, this will all be sort of new to me. Cool. In the 1980s, Marvel was publishing its American format Transformers comic, and over in the UK, it was publishing a weekly magazine-sized tabloid format comic. Being weekly, it was publishing 11 pages of Transformers material per week, 44 pages a month, or twice the page rate of the US, so they had to produce their own material. You'll immediately notice something about the UK Transformers material. The colors are so much nicer than the US versions. They used a glossy but thin paper, and their colorists were way better than the notoriously bad work by Nell Yomtov, who colored every issue of Marvel's US Transformers comic. Well, that is true, that they weren't great. The stories were almost all written by Simon Furman, and were designed to fit between the American stories with varying degrees of success. A ton of artists worked on the book, often alternating from issue to issue. Later in the book's run, they had to start including black and white pages for budgetary reasons, and the black and white pages were all UK original material. These comics are pretty random. Sorry about that. Ugh, nothing to be sorry about. This is interesting. Megatron vs. Quake. I don't even know who that is. Wait, Transformers and Visionaries? Okay. Started adding some other stuff. Uh, this one's missing a little bit of its cover, but that's okay. This is... All free and new. Micromasters need a magnifying glass to find them. <laughs> Random. Uh, Transformers in Action Force. Oh, so like the uh, the British G.I. Joe stories. That I, I uh, am curious to read too. So that's cool. Uh, that looks familiar. Like it might have been... Uh, that, that artwork I think might be by Andrew Wildman who eventually started drawing all the uh, Transformers stuff in the U.S. and then G.I. Joe. Yep. Look at that. Huh. Uh, not, a lot of this does not look familiar at all. I mean, the, the Transformers do a little bit, but uh, these characters, like, mostly never appeared in uh, the U.S. This this was, I think, the cover of a U.S. issue, though. And that's definitely Andrew Wildman. Huh. Cool. Very different. Free giant gift poster inside. This was something that British comics uh, tended to do a lot. They'd, they'd, they'd like to say things like free gift, and it would always be maybe like, you know, it had to be paper, basically. So maybe it was a poster, maybe it was like a mask, like a punch-out mask to wear, maybe it was stickers. So, very British thing to do. Killer on the Loose. Look at that. This, this supposes that a Cobra Eel is a match for Snake Eyes and Scarlet. Interesting. All right. Action Force is the British version of G.I. Joe. The comic was not as successful as Transformers. It only reached issue 50. Transformers reached issue 332. I really don't know what else to say. The book had painted covers by Jeff Sr. Oh yeah, the Action Force comic printed issues of Shang-Chi Master of Kung Fu as backup strips. Prior to the reprints, Action Force had a Shang-Chi cameo that revealed he was the one who taught G.I. Joe's Quick Kick martial arts. Yup. In the UK, Quick Kick learned martial arts from Shang-Chi. 
Weird, huh? That's very weird. Yeah, I thought that the only uh, sort of crossover of Transformers and G.I. Joe with Marvel Comics was the uh, Spider-Man and, and S.H.I.E.L.D. appearances in the uh, original Transformers limited series. That's very interesting. Shang-Chi taught Quick Kick. By that rationale, Quick Kick should be like the best martial artist in all of G.I. Joe. I like that. That's very unique. I, I like G.I. Joe. Um, Transformers was definitely my thing that I was into more as a kid. Um, but G.I. Joe was like number two. But as an adult, um, I'm kind of into both equally these days. Like I don't really get anything like merchandise, but I, I really do like both properties a lot. I want them to be successful. Transformers, last stand of the Wreckers. Here we go. This is another modern American comic, but you have said that you haven't read any IDW Transformers comics, so I thought I'd send it to you. Very nice. Last Stand of the Wreckers is an excellent place to start with IDW Transformers. It's set on an Autobot prison colony during the last days of the Autobot Decepticon War. It's about the elite Autobot team sent in to save the colony after it's overrun by Decepticons. The book is violent, strange, and wonderful, but most of all, it's self-contained. Like 90% of the cast is introduced for the first time in this book. That's cool. For many characters, it's not just their first IDW appearance, but their first appearance in Transformers fiction at all. I really hope you enjoy it. I know it's converted many people into IDW Transformers devotees. Well, that's great to hear. I'm... I'm very grateful. I can't wait to read it. Last Stand of the Wreckers. If it's self-contained, that is perfect. Thank you. Tales from the Transformers Beast Wars. This is a Transformers Beast Wars comic from the official 2000 Transformers convention BotCon. It's pretty awful. <laughs> Especially the I just discovered Photoshop coloring. Uh-oh. Why did I have two of these? I've never even been to the USA, let alone a Transformers convention. Collecting, eh? <laughs> yes, that speaks to you being a completionist. Wow, all right. Hey, if anybody likes bad comics, it's me, so good call. I'm, I'm looking forward to that, actually. Machine Men 2 and 3. This is going to need some explanation. In the 1980s, there were two major toy lines of transforming robots, the GoBots and the Transformers. Both were licensed from Japanese toy companies by American toy companies. GoBots was based on Machine Robo by Bandai, Transformers on Diaclone and MicroChange, and others, by Takara. For Transformers Global Marketing, uh, oh, sorry. For Transformers, global marketing was handled by Hasbro or its subsidiary, Milton Bradley. Transformers was Transformers everywhere in the world with the same characters and cartoon and basically the same toys. GoBots had its global marketing handled by Bondi and it was a mess. GoBots in the USA, Robo Machine in Europe, the UK, and Machine Robo in Japan. In Australia, it was marketed as Machine Men. As far as I know, this makes GoBots the only 1980s toy line with exclusive Australian packaging, fiction, and toys in the form of a bunch of recolored toys. These two pack-in comics, the second and third in the series of three, are the exclusive fiction I was talking about. I can't tell you anything about the artist Richard Ray, but I do find these comics very charming in their amateurness. Yeah, this looks like fan fiction to me. This looks like something I might easily come across on DeviantArt, and the fact that it was published like in a Hasbro toy is, is kind of amazing, actually. I can't wait to read this. I kind of love how 1980s this, this logo is. Machine Men. Although that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if, if I remember correctly, I believe the GoBots were not like a race of robots like the Transformers. I believe the GoBots were originally people that, uh, like, their planet had some sort of an apocalypse and they put their brains into machines. I'm pretty sure that, I've, that I'm remembering that right. Hell yeah. Look at this stuff. I love it. Not much of a note here. It just says, what if number 36 and Fantastic Four number 93... Okay, so some of the more standard American comics, but I have so much goddamn Fantastic Four, you just don't know, man. So I've included one issue by Jack Kirby Stan Lee 
and One What If by John Byrne. Fantastic creators, very well known for their work on Fantastic Four. That is very, very cool. Um, I actually have not read either of these, so that'll be new to me. Thank you. Uh, I hope that that was uh, fun for you folks to see some very different comics. Yes, there were some American comics, but obviously Andrew was kind enough to include a lot of British and Australian comics and give us a full context of what they were and why he thought they were worth reading. Very much appreciated. I can't thank you enough, Andrew. Um, and I hope that uh, one of these proves uh, unique enough that, that, that I just have to bump it right up to, to the front and review it. Who, who can say, right? But uh, very, very cool stuff. Um, I'm very, very much appreciative. To everyone out there, do not feel obligated to send me stuff, uh, but if you do, I can at least do something like this, an unboxing video, and uh, who knows, maybe it'll provide material in the future. All right, take care, everyone. Keep reading comics.